welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. God is good. We're going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. Is anybody excited about the word of God? I know I'm excited. God is good. You know, you don't come to church to hear from me. Don't come to church to hear from any of the teaching team that's here at The Rock. It's not about listening to a man or a woman, the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, or any other color we could imagine. Not about a tall man or a short man or any of that other stuff. We got to get off that. What we got to get onto is God. This is about us coming together and hearing from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. So if you would, honor the Lord, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, tonight is just awesome being in your house. Great to be in your presence, Lord. We love you, God. And, and it's just a privilege every time we come together to just host heaven and your people, God, and to experience your presence and just what you do, Father God. We just are grateful for what you've already done in this church service, God, lifting burdens, encouragement, God, taking those yokes of depression and despair off of people, God, and putting on those garments of praise, Lord. We, we're just excited about what you're doing here, God. And Lord, as we approach your word and open it up, we pray that you would open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and may we have hearts that have good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives, God. How wise you are that you can speak an individual word to each and every person in this room, God. Lord, we are in awe of you, and we praise you, and we thank you, God, that tonight you give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the encouragement, the strength, even the correction and the discipline that we need for our lives, Lord. We praise you and we thank you for that. And God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that our brothers and sisters, Lord, those that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you would bless them as you would bless us, speak to them and teach them as you would teach us and speak to us tonight, God. And Lord, we give you the praise, the glory and the honor. Be amongst them as you'd be amongst us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. Well, tonight is... Take your seeds, get your Bible out, open them up with me to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 1. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1. Now, I want to make a confession to you guys. I, I have, over the years, developed a taste for coffee. When I was a child, it was just a, a small thing. I, I would walk down the cereal aisle with my mom at the store, and I would always breathe in real deep because the coffee was on the other side of the cereal aisle. And I love the smell growing up. But anytime I would taste it growing up, ugh, bleh, duh, no, too bitter. Didn't like it. Then at a, at a party as a young guy, I was at this party and they introduced me to coffee ice cream. And there it had everything that the smell had, but it also had everything that ice cream had. And I was hooked, man. Coffee ice cream was where it was at. Then as a teenager, I was introduced to the sugary blended coffee drinks. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's sort of like the doorway drink, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, once you get on that, you're pretty much hooked. It, it's pretty much just a dark road from then on. And, uh, and so, you know, all throughout my teenage years, I, I was after those sugary coffee drinks. As an adult, you know, raising a family and children and being up all night with crying babies and that sort of a thing, just kind of out of necessity, I just started drinking coffee in the mornings. Because ain't no way I was getting going without a little kickstart. You know, I need a little help, and uh, hey, here it is. And so after some time, I developed a taste, you know, for, for the richness and the, and the real flavor of the coffee. And now my wife, she's so wonderful. She's over here on the front row, and she's so beautiful and wonderful. And oftentimes in the morning, if she's up before me or getting ready, getting, you know, everybody out the door, that sort of thing, she will make my coffee for me. And I got to admit, it's got to be confusing for her which coffees I like black and which coffees I like with cream and sugar. And so, you know, there are times where she'll make my coffee and I'll go, would you put cream and sugar? Well, this is the Nantucket blend. I take that black girl and she's like, come on, get out of here, you know, just go drink your coffee and get, go to work, you know. So one morning we were getting ready and my wife's up and she's making the coffee and doing the morning routine. Kids are, you know, getting ready and scrambling around trying to get some food in their bellies before they head off to school. And so she makes my coffee and she puts a scoop of sugar in there. And then the kids distract her and she's off helping with the prep of the morning. She comes back and she puts another scoop of sugar in my coffee because she's making my coffee. And so she scooped that scoop of sugar in there and then got distracted and went away. About this time, I come walking up and I said, is this my coffee? 
And she says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, perfect, you know, it's a black cup of coffee. I'm all excited. I sit down, and I'm eating my breakfast, and I'm drinking my coffee. And nothing wrong, you know, nothing different, nothing going on. Until I got to the last gulp. It was so sweet, it actually made my teeth hurt. I mean, it just whacked me in the face. It was just like, wham, oh, my goodness. And I said, did you put sugar in this? She goes, oh, I think I did, and I think I put two scoops. I went, that's all right. The rest of it was good. Just that last one just set me on edge, you know, and I went and drank some milk or something like that just to get it, my teeth back, you know, back, back to normal. As Christians, we need to stir ourselves. The title of tonight's message is Stirred. If we don't stir ourselves as Christians, life can get bland. Life can get dull. Life can actually eventually turn bitter. We need to stir ourselves up. Multiple times in the Bible, you will find that the Bible tells us we've got to stir ourselves. We've got to make something happen. We've got to go after something. We've got to do something in order to get to where we want to get to. See, our life is supposed to be a life that is seasoned. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth, and we've got to mix it in. We've got to mix it up. We've got to get in there and make something happen as Christians. Can't just sit idly by and hope or expect that something's going to happen without us getting in there and making something happen. In fact, all the people of God that you find in the Bible, yes, they had a word from the Lord, but they also went after it. They also looked for it. They also made something happen. They put effort, energy, work in. Many times you will find that God had promised things to people and it wasn't years or even some in their lifetime that they saw the promise come to pass and yet they still moved, they still did something, they still stirred it up. Are you listening tonight? So tonight I thought it'd be kind of fun to take a look at these verses in the Bible that tell us what to stir in our lives. A couple of things that we see in the Bible that tell us what to stir in our lives. You guys ready for this? Okay, we got to stir it up. Now listen, you cannot sit there and stare at me tonight. Okay, because otherwise you're like that coffee where all of the sugar went to the bottom, okay, and you're just kind of there, and then at the end it turns out bad. No, you got to get involved tonight. You got to participate tonight. Can't just spectate, okay? I'm not going to let you do that. You got to get into this tonight and stir yourself up because the more that you put in, the more that you will get out. Are you listening? So, what to stir in our lives? Number one is stir up your gift. I had you turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 1, talking about stir up your gift. The Apostle Paul is writing basically the last time he's going to write to this young pastor, Timothy. Timothy, remember, was like-minded with Paul. The Bible says that Paul went after Timothy because Timothy went after Paul. Timothy was so like-minded with Paul that Paul said, I got no one else like him. Man, Timothy is my boy. Timothy is my protege, if you will. Timothy's the one I'm pouring everything into. Why? Because Timothy thinks like me. Timothy walks like me. Timothy talks like me. Timothy is the man. Are you listening? And so Paul thought so much of Timothy that he poured his life into this young pastor. And now he gives him an assignment to go to the church at Ephesus and be the senior pastor there of this massive church. And so Paul knows that his time is short. He knows he's already been poured out like a drink offering, and he's coming to those last final drips, coming out. He knows soon he's going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's basically writing his last words to Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter number 1. And the first thing, one of the first statements that Paul writes to Timothy is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 6. He says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He says, Timothy, right off the bat, I know that you had faith. I know that your mother had faith. I know that your grandmother had faith. If you read the, the verses around that, you'll find this out. And he says, but that's not enough. You've got to do something. I've prayed for you. I have laid my hands on you. I have imparted a gift to you by the Spirit of God. God has given you a gift, but you can't sit idly by, Timothy. You can't just hope something's going to happen. You can't just sit there and, well, maybe God will do it. Maybe he won't. And then if he doesn't, we say, oh, it must have been God's will that it didn't happen. No, 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 no. Listen, we've got to get off of that type of thinking. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, yeah, you're like-minded. Yeah, you're wonderful. But you've got to stir it up, son. You've got to make it happen. You've got to move with it. You've got to use it. You've got to stir up the gift of God that is in you. Maybe some of, some of your translations read like this. Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame. You know, we get the picture, the image of a fireplace. 
just like we talked about this morning. Fireplace, you know, if you have a roaring fire there and you're enjoying the warmth of that fire and you kick back on the couch and you're channel surfing, doing your thing, you know, after a while, if you neglect that fire long enough, what's going to happen? It's going to die down and you're no longer going to have the heat that you once enjoyed. And so Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you have a gift. It was on fire. It it was spreading. It was growing. And yet if you neglect it, Timothy, it's going to die down. And I want you, Timothy, to fan into flame. What does that mean? Well, at my house, I know when I'm, I'm doing my fireplace thing, what do I have to do? I have to go and I have to get my tools. And I have to bend low and, and I have to, to start to poke around in there. I have to stir some things around. Maybe I have to add a log. Maybe I have to space them out so that there's some air in between it, right? And then I start to blow into it. I start to fan into flame those little embers. Maybe you got to turn some. Maybe you got to put something over on the other side. Spiritually, what does this mean to us? It means that we got to get a hold of our tools. We've got to get a hold of faith in the Word of God. And we got to humble ourselves, bend down low. And you got to start to speak, and you got to start to declare the Word of God. you got to start to move in the gift that God has given to you, and you got to start making things happen. Maybe look at it from another angle. Maybe start to turn some things over in your life or reprioritize. Are you listening tonight? And so we got to stir up the gift of God that is in us. You have a gift, and God wants you to use your gift for the glory of God. You say, Pastor, me? Little old me? Here in San Bernardino, I mean, I'm not gifted, I'm not talented, I'm not smart, I'm not educated, I'm not pretty, or any of that kind of stuff, you know, but, but what, what are you talking about? I have a gift. Well, in the Bible, it tells us, 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verse number 10, take a look at it with me up on the overheads, 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verse number 10, as each one has received a, oh, come on, come on, remember, I said I'm not going to let you just sit there tonight, you got to stir it up tonight. As each one has received a what? A gift. Minister it to one another. What does that mean? Stir it up. What does that mean? Fan it into flame. As good stewards or managers of the manifold or many-sided grace of God. God says, I'm giving you a gift. I'm giving you ability. I'm giving you my power to do it. And yet, if you just sit there with it in your lap, I'm not going to do you any good. So what does God put in your hand? What is the gift that God has given you? Maybe some of you have the gift of gab. And you said, yeah, I just like to talk. Well, listen, this house has places for people who have the gift of gab. We, we've got assignments for you. We want you to host people. We want you to go and teach people. We want you to go out there and reach people for Jesus Christ. We want you to go and invite someone to church. See, there are many ways that you could use that gift, but if all you use that gift for is just gabbing at work, gabbing here, gabbing there, but you never use it for the Lord... Mm, now you just missed the point. Oh, maybe you have a gift and you say, my gift is I make money. I'm very gifted at business. Hey, that's great. But if all you're doing is accumulating wealth, if that's all you did, then eh, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. But when you take your gift and now all of a sudden you start to pour it into the kingdom of God and put it into God's hands and you say, all right, I'm going to give my tithe, but over and above that, I'm looking for a project. I'm looking for something to get involved in. I'm looking for a way to use my gift. I'm going to start teaching other people. I'm going to start raising up entrepreneurs. I'm going to start building the kingdom of God with my gift. Now, all of a sudden, what are you doing? You're stirring it up. You're using it for the glory of God. Whatever your gift is, some people say, I just like children. Then, hey, go rock some babies over there in the nursery. Go, go, go play with some children out there. My goodness, some people say, I had a troubled teenage life. And now on the other side of that, I think I can help a teenager in their walk with the Lord. Well, then, hey, go talk to Pastor Richard and the youth over there and start helping some teens. Whatever it is, maybe you like cars and cars is your thing. Then go be in the parking lot and be with cars. (laughs) Go help people park cars. Do something with your gift, but you got to stir it up. We can't just sit on our gifting and hope that the job is going to get done. God says, I want you to stir up your gift. I want you to use it for the glory of God. God gives us a gift and finds it covered with dust. That we don't know the gift. And also, we don't know the giver. Are you listening? God gave us a gift. He said, here, I want you to have this. We received that gift. God came back later and found us with that gift with dust all over it. It had not been used. The number one I would, I would know that, number one, we don't know God. 
Why? Because God gives good gifts to his children. When God gives a gift, he wants to give it to you not only for his benefit, but for your benefit. The Bible tells us that when we use our gift to refresh others, that we ourselves are refreshed. But also, we don't know the gift that God has given us. When you unlock, when you use what God has put in your hands, now all of a sudden, it just opens up and it just explodes with meaning and purpose. Think about Moses was raised up, right? Here he was raised up in Egypt to be, you know, the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. Here he is, this great and mighty man. And then after something takes place in his life, he runs out to the wilderness, and for 40 years, he's a shepherd. Here he is thinking, you know, i got all this military experience. I've got all this wealth experience. I've got all this business experience. I've got all this worldly experience. And now here I am, and my only experience is with sheep wandering around the wilderness with this staff in my hands. And yet it was both of those experiences, what God had put in Moses' hands, that made him the able leader to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt to do great military exploits and to lead them with that rod in his hand which God delivered Israel through to part the Red Sea, to do miracles, signs, and wonders, and to know that wilderness as they wandered in it for 40 years. Are you listening? He had to have that heart of a shepherd to lead the sheep of Israel. So what is it that God's put in your hand? What is the gift that God has given to you? Now it's time to stir it up. Fan it in the flame, church. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. What to stir in our lives? Number one is stir up your gift. Second thing, second thing for tonight is stir up others. Stir up others. You say, wait a second, what do you mean stir up others? Well, let's take a look at it together in the Word. You're there in 2 Timothy. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter 10, a great couple of verses in Hebrews chapter number 10, talking about things we can stir in our lives. We can stir up others. God never intended us for, to live an isolated or insulated life. From the moment we are born, we are born into relationships, cast on others for our needs. And so God put us into this earth with relationships and with people around us. And now God says, you can stir up your gift, but I also want you to stir up others. I want you to encourage someone else. I want you to help someone else. Let's take a look at it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 24 says this. And let us consider one another. Everybody say one another. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, that's you. Look at your other neighbor and say, that's me. Okay. Let us consider one another. Why? In order to stir up love and good works. Now, that word stir up here doesn't mean fan into flame like we saw a moment ago. This stir up is a little bit different. This stir up is a little bit more fun. This stir up literally means, and some of your translations may say this, to provoke. Literally means to prod or to, you know, poke at. To, to encourage in such a way that it's actually a, a, a little bit competitive, it's a little bit, uh, I, I don't know, rivalry sort of a thing where, where you're actually stirring one another up, you're poking at each other, you're prodding at each other, you are provoking one another. Why? To love and to do good deeds. Now, we're the body of Christ. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord in here. And how many of you, when you were growing up, loved to bug your brother's and your sisters. Hello. Can I get, thank you. Thank you very much. Those, these are all the younger brothers and sisters that are raising their hand. All the older ones said, I hated that. <laughs> but what is God saying? God is saying as the body of Christ, as a family, we've got to encourage one another. We're here in a relationship. We're here in this church. Why? To just sit here? No. To encourage one another, to use our gifts. And so if you see your brother or your sister sitting there, and you say, hey, what you up to? Nothing. Well, pff, you need to come on. You need to go love somebody. You need to go do something. Why don't you come with me on the outreach? Every Saturday we go out. Why, why don't you come with me to be a greeter at the door? Why, why, why don't you come on and help me? We're going to be going out and we're going to be witnessing and, and, and handing out invites to church. Come on with us. See, the Bible says that we are to provoke one another. We're to stir one another. We're to encourage one another. How about this? You don't see someone in church. Hmm. Just the other day, I was thinking about somebody. I said, man, I haven't seen them in a while. So I took out my phone and I texted them. Oh, thank God for technology. It has made it so easy to bug people. 
So I texted him, hey, man, just thinking about you. Haven't seen you in a while. Love you. In church the next service. Was in church the next service. Are you listening? He said, we never left. We were here. You know, you just didn't see us. We got some things going on. So we've been switching around, you know, where we're going. But we're here. We're here right now. I want to make sure you see me. Here I am. Praise the Lord. What happened? I bugged him. Poked him. Messed with him. Right? Next verse, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. See, there are some people who say, nah, it's cool, you know what? Uh, God loves me, and I don't need to go to church for God to love me. I've got the Bible. I can worship the Lord anywhere. God is everywhere. And what do I need the church for? Here's what you need the church for. You need the church for a big mouth preacher to bug you, get in your face and tell you like it is. You need the church for your neighbor next to you to bug you, get in your face, to be accountable, to, to say, hey, come on, friend. We're going to go love somebody. We're going to go encourage somebody. We're going to go tell somebody. We're going to go love someone. Come on, church, let's stir ourselves up and let's stir one another up. Man, I tell you. I have a dog named Max. Max is a little white, fluffy dog. He's the cutest thing you've ever seen in your life. He is a Pika Poo. Pika Poo is a Pekingese mixed with a poodle, okay? And he's just this little guy, little white thing, you know, and, and uh, we know when he's been into digging and stuff like that because he comes in brown. But when he's white, man, it's just like you just want to love him and pet him and all that kind of stuff. He's a good dog, okay? Now, I know my wife is over there gushing. She loves the dog. He's like her fourth child. And I'm just like, I didn't want the dog, but, you know, now I accept him. <laughs> For Max's first birthday... I had the assignment to get Max a present. So I went and I got Max the biggest bone I could find. Raw hide, right? I went out there and I got him this massive bone. And so I brought it into the house and put a bow on it. And we sang happy birthday to the dog. And I presented Max with his bone. Now, much to my delight, Max was scared of the bone. <laughs> you say, why do you like that, Pastor? Here's why, because I just love tormenting the dog, right? <laughs> and so I took that bone, and I said, Maxie, come on, Maxie, Maxie. You know, and he's like, right? And he's, 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 he's just afraid of this bone, and so I'm tapping it on the ground, and he's skittering on the tiles, can't get running fast enough, you know, and he can't get going. And so I'm just messing with him with this bone, you know, and everywhere he goes, he goes this way, I go this way, he goes, you know, and he's barking at the bone, and, and, and my goodness, you know, just didn't like the bone. Just to see if we could get him to, uh, you know, love the bone or eat the bone or do something with the bone, we put it in his kennel at night when he went to sleep. I don't think he slept all night. I think he was on one side, the bone was on the other, you know. He came out, and there was the bone. Now, Max didn't really pay too much attention to this bone until we had some friends over. They brought over their dog, Molly. Now, Molly's a little bit bigger than Max, cute dog. And Molly just loved this bone. Molly was gnawing on this bone, was loving on this bone, and now all of a sudden, Max has a problem. That's my bone. Now, Molly was so cool about it. It was, it was hilarious, and, and my wife and I just enjoyed watching this because Molly got to the point where she put her paw on the bone. and She was standing there. She had one paw on the bone, okay? And she would not look at Max. She just stood there with a paw on the bone, looking away from Max. Now, Max is barking in her ear. Rack, 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 rack. Rack, rack. Molly's just standing there, foot on the bone, won't look at Max. Max would go around to the other side. She'd turn her head the other way. <laughs> and yet Max would go for the bone, and then Molly would kind of start and, you know, and, 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 and just for a long time like this. Finally, Max slowly creeps up on the bone, and he's looking, and Molly's still standing there, foot on the bone, not paying him any attention. Max gets right up on her ear and nips her ear. Right at that moment, what does Molly do? You know, snarls at him and barks at him. Max goes racing around the couch, you know, hiding behind the couch now. 
And there he is. He snuck up on her later and scared her. My goodness, we had so much fun watching that. In the same way we as believers need to stir one another up. Sometimes we can't just bark at somebody and expect the results. No, you need to nip at their ear. You ever had somebody tell you, I need to chew your ear for a minute? See, as believers, it's got to get serious. It's got to get real for us. We've got to go beyond just talk, and now it's time to start prodding. It's time to start provoking. It's time to start stirring one another up. It's time to start going after it. You know, we're doing this Freedom for Our Future campaign. My goodness, do you know who the best messenger of that is going to be? Us, right? Get a hold of somebody. Hey, what are you doing to get involved? Hey, you have a testimony? You need to go and share that testimony. Man, go on the website. Go write it down. Put it in there. Hey, you need to go out there and serve at one of the tables. You need to go and be one of the people that, you know, wear your button. What are you doing without your button? Go poke somebody with a button. No, don't poke them with a button. Okay? But my goodness, we need to stir one another up. We need to see what God sees in other people. Sometimes people don't know their gifting, and it takes somebody coming along and provoking them and prodding them and pushing them and saying, you've got this gift. I believe in you. You can do it. Come on. We're going to go together. I'll encourage you. Man, let's go and take this world for Jesus. That's what this is about. What to stir in our lives? Number one is stir up your gift. Number two is stir up others. Last thing for tonight. Last thing for tonight. Stir up your godly passion. Stir up your godly passion. Now, we know all the ungodly passions that try and get stirred up in our lives each and every day. Now, the opposite of that should be so much more true in our lives. And yet, oftentimes, I find that in my own life and in the life of people around me that are Hey, born-again believers, Christians, people who love the Lord, who are excited about the things of God, and yet sometimes our godly passions are not at the levels they should be. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm throwing myself right in there, including I am a part of this lump, all right? Why? Because things don't bug me like they should. Are you listening? There are things that I see that do not invoke a response that they should. There are so many injustices in this world that are being presented to us every day that we should be the most fervent in prayer, the most passionate, the the loudest voice that's out there. And yet oftentimes we shrink back and say, well, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, I, I can't do anything about that. I'll pray for them, and then we never do. And listen, I'll be guilty of this too. And yet God says, I want you to stir up your godly passion. I want you to, to, to go after this thing. I want you to move in this area of your life. Let's take a look at it. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter number 17. Take a look at it with me. The apostle Paul has gone on ahead of his friends. He's traveling. Acts chapter 17. Verse number 16. He goes to Athens, Greece. Here he is in Athens. Athens is, you know, this epicenter. Wealth and knowledge, government. Supposed to be this great city. And yet when the Apostle Paul is waiting there in Athens for his friends to show up, he's looking around. And as he looks around, something happens in his heart. Acts chapter number 17, verse number 16. Acts chapter 17, verse 16 says this. It says, now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked. I've got it up here on the old King James Version. Take a look at it with me. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. This is that same provoking, that same prodding, that same piercing, that same grating we were just talking about before. While Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw... When he saw, see the Apostle Paul had been walking around, but he saw something that bugged him and it stirred his spirit when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. 
These people that were supposed to be this great economic, governmental people, this great wealth of knowledge and wisdom, these people who profess to be wise in the world's standard, these greatly revered people, and yet when he's walking around, he doesn't see knowledge, he doesn't see wisdom, he doesn't see greatness. What does he see? He sees idols everywhere. He says people deceived all over the place that have played into the devil's trick, and it bugs him. Oh, he gets riled up in his spirit. He gets stirred in his spirit. Now, what does he do? Does he condemn them? Does he beat them over the head with a Bible and say, you guys are suckers. You need to repent. Does he go out and say, ah, forget you people. You're all given to idols. I'll go preach somewhere else. No. What does he do? He finds a way to take that godly passion and stir it up in the right way. And you know the story. He starts to preach to them when he finds one of their altars that says to an unknown God, and he says, today I declare to you the unknown God. Now all of a sudden he's got their attention. Now all of a sudden they're saying, oh, is this some sort of new teaching? Is this some sort of new wisdom we can get a hold of? And he declares to them the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, God wants us to stir up our godly passion. God wants us to be angered, but do not sin, like the Bible says. God wants us to be irritated, but not to the point of frustration, but to the point of faith. And God wants us to take those godly passions as things are going on in our world around us, as we see the lost, as we see injustice, as we see things that we as the church have the answer to that the world needs and wants, and we're to stir up that godly passion and we're to go pour it into the lost and the dying world around us. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, every day there's going to be heat that's applied to our lives. Just like the rising of the sun, the Bible tells us in the parable of the sower that each and every day, like the rising of the sun, heat is applied, persecution takes place, things happen. There's going to be things that grate against us, going to be things that bug us in the spirit, things that rub us the wrong way. Now, when heat is applied and there's no stirring, what happens? Things burn. Anybody who has ever ruined their dinner painfully and distastefully is very aware of this fact. That if you leave a pot of spaghetti or whatever it is you were cooking that night sitting there without stirring long enough, it's going to burn. And so in our lives, as things, as the heat of this world is applied, as things come against us, as pressures of life and trials, temptations, and things come against us, what do we have to do? You have to stir up that godly passion. Financial pressures, come on, time to stir up that faith for finances. As family pressures come on, hey, time to start stirring up the love. Time to start stirring up the time that we can spend with our families. Time to start stirring up. Maybe you need to go and give a gift to somebody. When pressure's in the church, you know what? Sometimes the reason why people stay out of church is not just provoking and prodding, but because of offenses. And if that comes on, time to stir up that forgiveness. Let it bug you enough to do the right thing about it. Are you listening? And so we don't need to get burnt by doing nothing. We need to go forward and get stirred. Don't get burned, get stirred. Let the irritation and the provocation move you to tell someone about Jesus. To do good works, to give and to sow, to be in faith, to pray, and to speak the word of God. Are you listening tonight? Amen. Many of you guys remember the story in John, the fifth chapter. We won't go there tonight. I'll just paraphrase the story for you. That there was a lame man, 38 years, been lying by the pool of Bethesda. Why? Well, because every now and then, the Bible says that an angel would come and stir the waters. And as he stirred the waters, the first person that got in got healed. So here he is, 38 years, been sick, hasn't been able to save himself. Every time he sees the water stirring, he starts to get up. But remember, he's lame, and so he's trying to work his way over there. And somebody else jumps in before him. They get healed, and they get out. Jesus comes along, and Jesus looks at this man, and he says, hey, what are you doing here? And he says, sir, I have no one to carry me in. When the waters are stirred, somebody gets in there before me. And what does Jesus do? Jesus says, rise, take up your mat, and walk. Church, he could have sat there and said, thank you, Jesus. I appreciate you saving me. I appreciate you healing me and could have laid on that mat. And yet the Bible records that he stood up, took up his mat, and he walks. Listen, many people are waiting for someone else 
to stir them, waiting for someone else to do the work, waiting for the angel to come, waiting for God to come and do something. And yet we've got to get a hold of the word of God tonight that says stir yourself up. Stir up the gift of God. Stir one another up. Go and provoke somebody to love and to good deeds. And stir up your godly passion. Get a hold of that word. And listen, take up your mat and walk. It's time to go and do something with this tonight, church. Tonight, look for ways that you can immediately apply it. Some of you, maybe that means that you're going to go in in your prayer times that you pray in the Spirit and stir up that gift. Some of you, that means that you're going to call somebody. Some of you, that means that you're going to share Jesus with somebody that this week. There are so many ways that God can apply this to your life. Stir it up, church. Stir it up. What did we learn tonight? Well, we learned what to stir in our lives. Number one, stir up your gift. Number two, stir up others. Number three, stir up your godly passion. If you got something from the Lord tonight, come on, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, you guys have been awesome tonight. I just want to thank you for allowing me to speak into your lives and provoke you a little bit prod at you. Maybe tonight you said a little bit of ouch more than you did amen. That's okay. We're all there. Tonight, it'd be a tragedy for us to come into the house of God, and you know, only at the rock do I know of that you can have a Samoan lead you in a victory chant and then sing a South African song. You know, just cool, just a lot of fun. It'd be a tragedy if we came into the house of God and had a good time like we did, praising and worshiping the Lord, experiencing His presence, and listening to the Word of God, and you guys were great. And then we let you walk out of this place tonight. Your heart wasn't right with God. You died and went to hell. Listen, I don't want that to happen to you. I know you don't want that to happen to you. Most of all, God doesn't want that to happen to you. Sometimes people say, well, Pastor, that's not going to happen to me because I don't believe in hell. You know, I believe that God is good and he's not going to send anybody to hell. Listen, God doesn't send people to hell. We choose hell by our lives while we're here on this earth. We have a choice. We can choose. God gives us that blessing to choose him. God could have created a whole bunch of robots that would just love him, but God didn't want that sort of shallow, empty love. God wanted us to have a free will choice to choose him. With our lives here on the earth, we have that choice to choose heaven or choose hell, choose life or choose death. And hell is a very real place. Jesus talked about it in the Bible. He's talked about it all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. And by burying your head in the sand and saying, I don't believe in hell, doesn't make it go away. It doesn't make it any less real. You're going to have to face the reality of it. That's like saying, I, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Well, go out on the slow lane of the freeway. You'll meet one face-to-face sooner or later. And today, let's talk. Let's make sure that you don't go to hell, but that you end up in heaven forever and ever with God. Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven. You know, I'm going to get to heaven just be- because God will let me. Everybody gets to go to heaven. All roads lead there. You have your truth. I have my truth. And as long as we're true to our own truth, you know, it starts sounding kind of funny after a while. But people say, as long as we're true to ourselves or true to whatever we want or you do your thing, I'll do my thing, we'll all get there somehow. But listen, that's not going to make it. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible say all roads lead to heaven? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. We're going to have to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, beaten, bloody, mess, hung on a cross. Don't you think if he did all that, that he would let us know how to get to heaven? Of course he does. He tells us how in his word. Now, sometimes people think, well, that's good news because, you know, I've been a good person. I know, like, like God lets good people into heaven, and I've been a really good person. You know, it used to be bad, but I cleaned, my, cleaned up my act. Now I'm, I'm good. And I, and I believe God's going to let me into heaven because I've been a really good person, been nice to my neighbors, gave money to charities, helped people out. I've been good enough, I think, to get into heaven. Now, I'm glad you did all those good things. Could you just show that to me in the Bible where it says your good works get you into heaven? Because it's not there. Quite, quite the opposite, actually. The Bible tells us that our good works compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. Not going to make it. Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no grading scale, no curve, no line that you have to be above in order to be this good and then God will let you into heaven or be more good than you have been bad. And yet a lot of people think that's what's going to get them into heaven when nothing could be further from the truth. Tonight I love you enough 
respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven. Now, sometimes people think, well, you know what? I was raised in church. My parents told me you were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child. And, and you know, you, you went to Sabbath school or Sunday school or catechism class. Born in America. America is the Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible? Let's check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere does it say that you're raised in church, parents tell you you're Christians. That makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, or be born in America, that that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere, nowhere do we see in the Bible, God says that, well, you're not some other religion, and by default, lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. Come on. Love you, respect you, and honor you enough tonight to not play games, tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. So he said, well, okay, Pastor Dan, I, I get that. I understand that. But not only when I was a child did I go to church here, I'm sitting in church in front of you tonight. I consider myself to be a Christian. It's great. I'm glad you're here. But could you just show that to me in the Bible where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Because it's not there. That's like saying I could go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, bring a Dodger uniform, wear that Dodger uniform, bring my bat and my ball, sit in the dugout, call myself a Dodger, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because, hey, I'm not one of the Dodgers. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work. Some of you might be thinking, I understand that. I get that. But, you know, my last church, you don't understand. I, I got involved. I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a, a leader. I sang in the choir, even taught in the Bible classes, got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible. Could you were a church involved and get you into heaven? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. That you sing in the choir, teach in the Bible classes. Come on, it's not there. And again, nowhere do we see in the Bible, God, I'm looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Come on, let's talk tonight. Let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Now, some of you might be saying, yeah, I get all that, but I know God. Somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. Just finished celebrating Easter and the resurrection. I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament. Come on, I know God. Yeah, everybody in America knows God. That's like the worst question you could ask somebody, do you know God? Everybody will say, yeah, we know God. We know about Jesus. We know about Easter and the resurrection. We all celebrate Christmas every year of our lives, and yet... If you'd read your Bible, you would know that the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scriptures. It's recorded for us in the Bible to see. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a moment. This is not about what you have in your head. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is. That gets you right with God and headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Now, who was Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. That meant that he held to the strictest form of the law at that time. This was God's law. So he was a religious man. He did a lot of good deeds. He was raised up in his church called the synagogue. He got involved. Eventually, he became the head of his church. He could quote the scripture. He could preach the scripture. My goodness, he could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? He gave his money. He did a lot of good deeds. People looked to him to find out about God. He was a teacher of Israel. And yet when Jesus comes to this great man, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, you've been doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. Now, many times people turn off right there and they say, born again, I heard about that. I saw that in a movie. I, I, I read about that in a magazine or on the internet. I, I, I know somebody was reading a book about that and, you know, it's really weird. It's really crazy. I don't want to have any part of that if that's what you're talking about. And yet, let's not let the world define. Let's not television books and movies define what being born again mean. Let's let the Bible define what being born again means. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant that same thing. 
means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, I'm coming soon. Don't you know he is? And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, what is Jesus talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, little out. A little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I, I need to give God all my heart. I need to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. Say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet tonight, many of you, your flesh will try and talk you out of it. Embarrassment. Devil's trying to push you out of it. And yet, I'm provoking you tonight. Why? Because I don't want to see you go to hell. God doesn't want to see you go, go to hell. He loves you. Wants to be with you so much so that he died for you. Come on. You can get over it and give Jesus Christ your heart and life tonight. Simply acknowledging your need for Jesus by raising your hand in a moment. Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God. Or you can give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now, who should raise their hand? Hey, if you've been running from God instead of to God tonight, I'm speaking to you. If you're not sure about your salvation, come on tonight. Don't leave this place unsure. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Never given God all your heart. Never given God all your life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Hey, come on, you can get right with God simply raising your hand. Acknowledging your need for Jesus. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, you can raise your hand right where you're at, and then you can click the blue button, and someone will lead you in a prayer. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Thank you. There's one. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? One wise person already. Come on. Come on. If you need to give God all of your heart, you need to give God all of your life. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Come on, stir yourself during this time. If you know you need to do it, don't just sit there and stare because you're going to get burned. God is calling out to you and saying, come on, come on. I love you. I want to be with you. Stir yourself up right now. If you know you need to do this, come on. Anybody else real quick? Come on. Come on. If you need to give God all your heart and all of your life, no one's judging you. No one's condemning you. No one's going to laugh at you and say, look at that fool raising their hand. Listen, we all have done this one way or another at one time or another. We're excited for you. We want you to do this. God is overjoyed. Anybody else real quick? There's one wise person already. Will you join him? Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm not selling knives at the county fair. This is real. We're talking about your eternal life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one more opportunity, then I'm going to close this up. And listen, you've missed enough opportunities in your life. If that's you, you need to give God all your heart and all of your life. Come on. Simply raise your hand. And I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Thank you, number two. God bless you. Who else tonight? Who else tonight that I didn't already see? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, I'm going to close it up. Hey, listen, the Bible says that there is a party in heaven rejoicing amongst the angels. Just over one person who repents. Tonight, we got double the party. All right, so come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah.
Now listen, both of you that raised your hand, or if you didn't, but you should have. It's not too late for you. Here's what I want you to do in a moment. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, a Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Right? We're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. As we do that, Elijah's going to lead us in a song. When you hear that, that's your cue. Get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Okay, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend. Let's all stand and welcome them. No one leave during this time. You come right now. Come on down. Come down to the front right here. Let's give them a hand as they come. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Come on, you know you need to do it. Take that step. Hey, provoke your neighbor. Say, come on, friend. I'll go with you. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. If that's you, you need to come. You need to come. You need to come. All right. Hey, a couple more came up. That's awesome. So happy for you guys. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here with the cool shoes. Did you guys notice this? We're, we're like... We're like brothers here, man. Oh, yeah, fist pump it. Good deal, good deal. This is my, this is my brother, Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? The weirdest thing tonight is that we're wearing the same shoes, okay? Nothing else strange, I promise. You know, sometimes you go to church, you want to really weird. That's about as weird as it gets. After that, it's just cool, okay? Now, listen, he's going to do three things with you. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance, okay, so that you're not wondering or afraid, okay? First thing he's going to do is lead you in a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Okay? Second thing he's going to do is going to give you some free stuff. A little booklet our pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. Take you maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes to sit down and read it if you read it slow. Okay? Now, I know we invest more time into television, movies, phone conversations, video games, stuff like that, than 20 or 30 minutes. You can sit down, read about what to do next in your walk with God. Final thing he's going to do is he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, right? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. It's a five-week process, okay? Meet with you once a week for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible. That's just one a week right before any church service that you choose. Couldn't get any easier. And they'll just sit with you, encourage you, pray with you, might provoke you a little bit, you know, stir you up. Okay, and, and basically all it's going to do is going to help you get strong in the ways of the Lord so that you go on with God. Don't go back serving the devil. Okay, so if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.